Welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> Are you gonna be kind to me? Oh yes, don't sleep tonight. <laughs> oh, I'm ready to get the next victim. We are now at a New Jersey Horicon. Get your COVID shots, huh? <laughs> get your COVID shot, and then Freddy will slice you up. Ah, thanks a lot. I'm at the New Jersey Horror Convention in Atlantic City at the showboat. We're gonna meet people from our past, present, and all the scream fests you can devour. For some reason, I do feel afraid, should I? Oh, very much so. Feel afraid, child. You're in my house. <laughs> Father Evil, what are your powers? What are you going to do? I am the purveyor of sin. I give you the sin you want the most, and I let you indulge. Then once you've had your fill, I come and collect. That would be you. Pay the Piper. How can they see more of Father Evil? Where are you at? I am all over social media. FatherEvil.com, Father Evil on Facebook. Same thing on Twitter, and same thing on Instagram and on TikTok. Can you bless me in sin? Thank you. I think I need a new brain. I screwed up your name. I need a brain transplant. Patty Mullen, I watch your movie. I love it. Question. I'm not sexist. I'm not misogynist. Why do I have to be so PC? No, you were sexy and hot and creative and cool. How did you approach the role of Frankenhooker? Um, you know, I just took directions from Frank Henenlotter. He's a genius at this. And uh, it just took on a life of its own. You think you become the character after a while? I mean, you could just snap into it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very easily. Absolutely. It's a sh it's a, it keeps on giving. You heard the New Jersey Horror Con in Atlantic City. What do you want to say to your fans, do, uh, your appreciation about, you know? Isn't this great? Um, it's amazing that after all this time, it's still being watched and still making people laugh. It makes me feel good. Makes you feel good. A lot of art has been inspired by this. Oh, really? Well, like what? Oh, you name it. I have people coming up with paintings and uh, uh, plaques and dolls and different things that they've made, earrings, and, you know, it's just amazing. So besides enjoying it, creativity is enhanced and it keeps it, giving it a second and third and fourth life. What are you doing now, though? What, what, what do fans want to know about what you're doing now? Well, pretty much like everybody else in the world, laying low, um, kind of put everything on hold, you know? So just starting over like everybody else, coming out slow and... Uh, Hoping for the best. It's so good to see faces, man. I smile at everybody I see, and uh, I don't know. Well, she came back to life, and she's back to life again. Back, hey, there you go. Bingo. Thank you very much. Adam Birman, Princeton TV, Princetonian Now, and Breezing with Birman, the podcast, Atlantic City. We're with, are you fans, fanatics, are you evil? What should I say? Uh, mostly, uh, mostly, uh, mostly evil. Mostly evil. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! Anyway, uh, what's your name? Uh, my name's Jack. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Seoul, New Jersey. Your name? Marissa. You're from? Mulligan Hill. And? Bridget. Are you officially out of your parents' will for being... I'm just joking. No, no. We're no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with horror film. It's part of the American consciousness. What do you like best? Favorite movies? Uh, uh, my first horror movie, Friday the 13th. Got a good classic. Mm, Nightmare on Elm Street. I like Terrifier. When you meet some of these stars, how do you feel? Are you? I like, don't know what to say. Like, you have no idea. Like, never thought this was gonna happen. Like, it's something you've always like think about, but like, you never think it could actually happen to you. Like, we just met Alex Vincent. And they signed. They signed Chucky. They signed uh, Tiffany. It was amazing. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> yeah, I got Alex Vincent to sign my uh, Tiffany doll. So what else, who else do you want to see today? What else is going to happen? Any spells, any magic, any paranormal experiences? Definitely. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. A little bit of everything. You never know. It's horror con. Anything <laughs> yeah. can happen. Can we have a meeting between the Chucky dolls? See what happens? Yeah. <laughs> Heart warming. Thank you very much. Hi, right, with Kim Myers, Nightmare on Elm Street 2. All respects to my wife. I've had a crush on you for a long... I, I don't know. I, I saw you on a Tuesday night. 
uh, got in for a dollar, was great, and, and it was funny. The movies, those movies were so much fun. Um, what does it mean to you now being part of this, this should I say, um, part of our DNA? Yeah, um, it, it's, well, I mean, it always surprises me. It's a little bit surreal, but it brings, I think it brings all of us that, that have a connection to these films, it brings us back to the time that we, that we made the films and how, um, uh, cat, what's the word? Um, how I think for many of us, the, the films launched us, launched our careers, Launched friendships, you know, lifelong friendships. That one I have with Mark, um, and just bring us back to the experience um, of, of making the film. So it's. What was the set like, though? Was it fun? Was it family? Was it distant? It it was not distant. It was fun and it was family. I think those are really good descriptions. And it was and it was it was serious. It was very professional. It was. Um, Respectful. I had a really fantastic time with all the actors. Mark and I, you know, have remained very close friends. Robert, uh, Robert England was amazing. I would, I would say, he had kind of a mentor-like um, relationship with with me. I think with a lot of the other actors. I think I've heard them describe that. It was my first film. How old were you? I was 19. Um, I just graduated. Well, I had graduated high school the year before. I just finished my first year of college, and um, had had never made a, a professional film. Got my SAG card through that, and Robert was really wonderful. As as was Mark. Just uh, how do you how do you approach a role like that? You're only 19. It's really hard to be terrified. Were you actually ever terrified screaming? You're really realistic, though. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, Robert was, was pretty terrifying. <laughs> he was very nice. And that was a funny contrast because when he wasn't in character, even with all his makeup on, you know, he was when he was not in character, he was just very kind, very professional, very very generous and supportive. Um, but when he was Freddy, he was terrifying. And, and it's the work you do. It's the preparation you do. It's understanding the story and the stakes and, yeah. No, because it's a fantasy world that we all got sucked into. And that's what I like. It, it, it is a, that mystery fantasy world. You don't know what's going to happen, and you have this unseen power that can have a hold of us. So maybe I'm getting too deep. But it, it is like a nightmare. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the, the franchise, I mean, I think the first film, in partic obviously in particular, because it was original, it really captivated and um, just kind of shifted... The world of, of horror films, in a way. I mean, it clearly. I agree. The way film, and it was not done with a big budget. And, and so. Robert England, did, did he help direct that, or, or he just drove the character, drove the mentor, drove the story? I was not aware of Robert doing any directing, uh, from my perspective. No, he was he, he was he was Freddie. He was he was. What about the present? Where are you today? Why are you here? What's happening? Are you enjoying this? Yes, it's it's fantastic. I mean, I I am not entirely new to the convention scene now. I don't do many, but um, this one in particular is, is wonderful. The, the organizers are so kind and the fans are just, they're wonderful. They're, they're, they're kind and they're, and they're um, clearly uh, so taken with this franchise and, and with, with the horror genre in, in general. It's, but it is surreal. It really is. Is when, as an actor, you 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 shoot a film, it's it's done. You move on to the next, hopefully, and then uh, and this one I think in particular because it was so long ago that we made the film. When when I was invited to do the first conventions a few years, well several years ago, I had no idea they existed, and I was absolutely shocked. I'm still. You know, just overwhelmed that that the fans are still connected to it and generations. Of fans. New fans, there are new fans, new fans. What I like about this, I'm going to be fandom now, is with all the explosions and the computer generated. I've I've known people who are now 18. They see this film and they go. Have, the funny thing is, have you seen this film before? <laughs> it's like, have you seen the Beatles before? Yeah, whatever. And, and, but here we go. So we have the present, we have the past. Let's celebrate both. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
The man I'm talking to, my grandfather knows him, my father knows him, I know him, Barry Bostwick. Hello. Now, of course, you have a legacy. Um, the legacy we cannot, uh, we cannot talk about, and I just forgot the name because I'm nervous talking to you. We throw toast. What's it called? <laughs> well, I get hit by toast. Brad Majors. Brad Majors. Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay, maybe I'll throw an unconventional question to you. Maybe you've answered this. You say there's a dark underbelly to that movie. What did you mean? What did you mean by that? I, uh, it's it, the themes are, you know, there's, there's a sadistic part to it. There's a, uh, obviously murder, mayhem, and um, uh, S and M. I mean, there's there's all kinds of dark dark elements to it that aren't always played up when you see it on stage these days. They, they clean it up an awful lot, you know, but I think what makes the movie special is that it has flip sides, you know, it's funny, it's over the top, yet it tackles some issues uh, that uh, weren't talked a lot about in 1975 when we made it. My grandfather, he thought it was so funny. I don't, maybe, but those things went over his head. It went over, as a kid, it goes over my head. You get caught up in the, 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 the other world of the audience and, and then the 12 o'clock midnight showing. Yeah, well, exactly. It's, it's, it's just a big party. I mean, if, if, you go, if you go to the theater, you know, it's a big party. If you're doing it at home, you have to create your own party. Uh, and it's always much more fun in the theater when there's a shadow cast and the the fans are, um, you know, doing all the interaction stuff. Um, that's really what saved it I, over the years, is that the different casts around the world have taken it to heart and taken it to, uh, you know, become not the past fandom, you know. I mean, they, they are obsessed with it. And, uh, and uh, I, you know... And Did it, that turn you off ever? Do you still embrace it? Oh yeah, no, I embrace it. I because you know it, it's doing so much good for them. I mean, so many of these kids uh, and adults who who do these shadow casts are um, uh, they're acting out a lot of their fantasies that they wouldn't have normally have a place to do it, and and uh, getting over maybe some shyness or some uh, you know antisocial issues or. A form of therapy, improvish therapy in costume. I think it is, you know, and particularly for these, you know, the, a lot of these kids are outsiders in a way. You know, they don't have they don't have a group, and they have found their group, and that group is important to them, and they carry that group throughout their whole life, even if they don't do the show uh, uh, after five or six years or something. They still have these people who love them and and uh, went through. Uh, a Friday and Saturday night uh, r ritual. It is outcast. No, I have to ask these questions though too. You were FDR. You were George Washington. How did you approach s s probably the most recognized brand name in, in in the world and play that role in the miniseries George Washington? For those who don't know, there was life before the internet, <laughs> and he was. Well, George Washington was. I, I always say that I got cast as George Washington because. I was six foot four, and George Washington was six foot three and a half. And I, w I probably just came in on the right day, and I was the tallest one in the office. Uh, but I think my general demeanor, uh, there's a calmness to it to me. Uh, I think I, 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 I study and uh, observe and, and, and get uh, the sharing from the people around me, the sort of, he was a committee guy, you know, he loved to surround himself with other voices and then he would, and then he would make his mind up uh, based on a lot of research with other folks. Um, and also it was based on uh, Thomas Flexner's book, uh, The Indispensable Man, which was uh, a brilliant exploration of uh, the, not only the early Washington, but the later Washington, uh, and he really humanized him uh, for the first time, I think. And I, I think that was the appeal of the series is uh, he wasn't just an icon. He wasn't just a, a guy riding around on a white horse, you know. He, well, you found the human being in him, which I think exposed to people. You keep on forgetting he's actually a human being before, before the myth. Yeah, yeah, flaws and all. I mean, he was um, the... Uh, 
And 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 then the series you can still find it, I think maybe on somewhere on eBay or you can even see bits and pieces of it on YouTube. I think it holds up very well. It, one of the first mini series, long mini series about a presidential, you know, character and. Uh, um, Patty Duke was brilliant in it. She played, she played Martha. Yeah, to me, it introduced me to the real person, past, past the, the, the cherry tree and the dollar bill. I talked to a person who used to be president of ABC te television, um, Steve McPherson, but anyway, um, he's from Princeton. And he said, someone like you is such a rarity that you've survived so, so long in such a business. And he says it is a tumultuous, unforgiving business. So any advice to anyone that you could have such a career and the longevity? It's like a full pro football player. If you make it three years, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, I don't just make, make good choices. Have good people who work for you, uh, who are able to bring to your doorstep projects that are, are, are meaningly, meaningful, you know. Uh, and uh, stay active. I think that's the whole thing, is that somebody gets into a hit show or a movie and then they think, oh, boy, well, this is the beginning of my big uh, career, you know, and, and they don't realize that it's, it's, it's what you do next, uh, six months later. Uh, it, it's the continuity, and you have to, and whether the, the next show is an indie film or, or even maybe just a, um, a guest shot on something that's a good show on television. If it's, you just got to keep your name out there. And uh, the, the, the people in power in show business change as you know so often and uh, you you constantly have to be reminding them now number one you haven't put on 200 pounds and number two you haven't lost your voice and uh, uh, or your hair you know or if you have this is what you look like now and if they're looking to cast somebody like that there's no surprises you know you 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 give them what they see uh, on a more uh, normal basis my friend said, it's like the economy. They don't want instability. They, they, they want to make money and they want to make, know that things are not, are not, are not stable. Yeah, well, and, and also I'm not, a, I'm not a star like that. I'm, I'm, I'm what I consider a journeyman actor. I'm, You've had some star moments. You've been a heart, heartthrob too back in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I consider myself still a heartthrob. <laughs> uh, but it's just my, uh, my heart is still throbbing. Uh, so I'm still a heartthrob, and uh, my, uh, it's funny, I mean, if you hang around here today, I mean, I just had a conversation with three 17-year-olds who love me, you know, they, they love me. And then I'll, then I'll talk to their grandmother, you know, at 73, and, and she'll go, she loves me. And so it's, it's about just keeping up with the times and, and being attractive, not just physically attractive, but doing work that... It, you know, covers all the all, all the generations. You do something on Hallmark. You do something in a TV series. You do a like you mentioned, um, uh, FDR American Badass. You know, a, a real culty kind of jokey film. That ha that movie was downloaded illegally millions of times in every college around the world, and so the kids, you know, the kids. Know me? Some of the kids know me from that. I, um, I was teaching class. They, they know who you are. They don't know your name, but they know who you are. I want to keep talking. I feel bad. I think people want want to take your photo and do things with you. I think someone just walked away. Well, finally, where where can they reach you? Oh, do you ever, I, I, well, I have a website, BarryBostwick.com, and I got all kinds of stuff on there, and uh, it, and it they can communicate with me on that and I, it, I you know, give announcements where I'm going to be next and uh, I sell my underwear I, you know, I sell my signed underwear I'm the only actor in the world who can legally I think sell their underwear uh, because Brad Majors was always in his underwear um, My aunt wanted me to kiss you but I'm not going to do that my great aunt and everything Who is it? Is that your grandma? Great aunt, great aunt. What's her name? Um, Edith Edith, Edith. Edith. Name Edith, I'm still hot. Bailing, what did I write about you? You're sexy, quirky, creative, and it's sometimes crazy positive. You're everything. 
everything, yeah. You've been in the Crow, you've been in Star Wars, The Crow, Entourage, the People's Liberation yeah, Army, yeah. the Train 2 and stuff. What are you doing now? Why are you here at, in Atlantic City, New Jersey Horror Con? Because I love traveling. I was shooting a movie in New York City, it's very close to here. I always love East Coast. And I think the Comic Con is great for me to meet my fans. Also, it's a way to see America. A lot of cities without Comic Con have never been there. So uh, also connect to my fans and enjoy life. What, what, what kind of um, um, reaction do your fans give you? Like love, adulteration, are they, are they shy? They want to know about certain movies? I actually, the, the, my fans love me from different, because I do different genre of movie, comedy, sci-fi, drama, action. So they, from different fans like different things. And they're just so appreciative. Some of them yesterday and today, they say just driving here to see me, which makes me feel so good. I mean, a whole new, genera whole new generation knew you from Entourage. And I, I know and stuff, and they know who you are. You made a big impression on them and everything. What about your sexual? You've been quite open about your sexuality. Has that helped, hurt, or you don't really don't care? I don't care that just me, just how I am. I'm very sensual in nature. So I like to be sexy because it's part of my nature. I think as a woman, you should embrace that. Because I was the first uh, woman actually from Asia to be on the cover of Playboy magazine in US, Germany, and Russia, and Japan. So I'm proud of it because now it's in a legacy. My brother actually sold that on eBay for quite a amount of money. Yeah, yeah you have fans all over the place. Anything. So, um, Anything else we want to know about you, what's going on with you? Because you're always reinventing yourself. Yes, good question, because I just reinvent myself. I made myself a director, debut director. I made a film called My Quarantine Romance with toilet paper. Join is COVID. It's a feature film. I direct, finance, produce, writing, and star in it. I did everything. Where can we see it? Uh, not yet. I mean, a post-production. You will see it because... It's gonna go viral because the comedy is about love, relationship, sex, so funny. About toilet paper, exchange toilet paper. <laughs> so funny. This has been the great violin. Can I kiss your hand? My wife, don't worry. Oh, sweet. Thank you. So follow me and I am Bailin Instagram, our official oh. Bailin Facebook. I'm so remiss. Again, say that again. Uh, follow me and I am Bailin Instagram and official Bailin uh, in Facebook, also real Bailin in Twitter. I give you because I give fat-free, sugar-free cookies. You'll like it. <laughs> JJ French of Twisted Sister, the soundtrack for a lot of people's lives. You're a motivational speaker. You own the intellectual property for... What are you doing here at New Jersey Horicon? You know, this is the first kind of post-COVID event. We used to do a lot of these prior to COVID, uh, and they'd be packed and then COVID just wiped everything out. So we were asked if we would participate and we're just trying to encourage people to get back out again and to, to start living again. And so we decided to come and do this and meet some of the fans right now and kind of like get America back to business about being kind of normal. I agree with you, we got we, yeah, a new normal, mitigate, mitigate COVID and, and go on. Well, you know, be safe. I mean, it was, we, uh, I'm from New York City. I lost six people in the first two months and thousands were decimated. New York City was decimated by it. Uh, we're, you know, we're in Atlantic City, it's not that far. Jersey was hit very heavily as well. Um, but our, 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 you know, look, Twisted Sister is responsible for two of the most famous songs in the history of rock. I want to rock and of course we're not going to take it, which became really a song that it just expressed frustration of people who are disenfranchised. And it applies to many, many different things and many different subjects. Right now they're singing it, the Ukraine, Ukrainians are singing it right now, uh, which you know is a humbling experience for us because everybody wants to help out in any way that they possibly can. Um, but this is a, just a way to reconnect with, with the fans again and show our appreciation for how much they've supported us. Next year will be our 50th anniversary, which is crazy. In fact, just to say those words, I need to take ibuprofen. Okay. Thank you, JJ French. I couldn't have said it any better. Okay, thank you, guys. Bye-bye. I'm Adam, Princeton TV with Adam and the Metal Hawks. TikTok, hey, this is the cutting edge. They're on TikTok. I'm not. So who are you? Who wants to speak first? Who are you? What do you do? And why do your fans love you? Take the mic. Hey, so we're Adam and the Metal Hawks. We're a new rock band coming out of Long Island, New York. Uh, we have our first album out right here, but we are coming out with our second album this year. Look for it this summer. We're touring Canada. We're touring Europe. 
Switzerland, Sweden, Malta. We're having it all, and we're coming along with for the ride. We want you guys to be there. What kind of music do you play, and why do your fans love you, or why do they want to sleep with you? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how I don't know how many of our fans want to sleep with us, but I, I guess they're available. No, we. <laughs> No, but we play like mostly like hard rock music. Like if you're in like Van Halen, Aerosmith, we're kind of like along those lines. It's, it's hard rock, but not really metal. But you know, you kind of just of it. And we play it because we like it, and that's all there is. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, whatever. Well, I think we need hard rock. Some of the music I listen is la di da. It's nursery rhymes. It's fine if you like that. Rock is. It should be rebellious. It should be rocking. It should be rolling and everything. You seem very quiet. Are you, are you George Harrison? Are you the Quiet <laughs> Beetle? <laughs> what are you yeah. <laughs> What's your name? I'm Johnny. My name's Griffin. Drums. Who's the alpha male here? Who who's the, who's the who does the strategy? Uh, who, who, who does the, the vision quest? Who's the creativity? I mean, yeah, we, we like to collaborate a lot. You know, uh, we, we kind of just throw all of our ideas and have a brainstorm session. And especially for TikToks, a lot of the times we come in, uh, you know, at night after people have work, after people have finished school, whatever, and just come up with ideas for TikToks uh, and stuff that we think will be fun and people will enjoy. Well, last thing, I think fame's coming here. I, I feel the charisma. I feel the vibe. What will happen? It's hard to predict. What will you do when the when the fame bug hits? And what will your life be like? Are you? Do you think you'll change a lot? I mean, I I think we would stay mostly the same. Uh, you know, no. just big production. <laughs> I'm gonna blow all my money on a gold mansion and a jacuzzi. <laughs> I love this guy. Well, that's not good. But uh, I'll use most of my no. share to just. Push super awesome music videos, you know, big stage shows. Maybe we could get Mark Mendoza to like come on stage. I don't know. That might be hard. You're, oh, oh yeah, I'm, what way. The hell? I'm Mark Mendoza from Twisted Sister. <laughs> this is Adam and the Metal Hawks, one of the hottest new bands around. Okay, Adam and the Metal Hawks. Go online, check them out. Because if you don't, I'll pay you a visit, and it won't be pleasant. <laughs> you don't want a visit from Mark Mendoza. <laughs> Adam Beerman with Adam and the Metal Hawks, Princeton TV. Hey! Yeah. Horror fans, we have a poison bonbon you're going to love. You are? Sandy Johnson. But your f claim to fame that grows and grows and never goes away is what? I was Michael Myers' sister in the original Halloween, so I was his first kill, Judith Myers. You're the cornerstone of, um, should I say, something that's now imprinted in America's DNA. When you made the film, did you know this was going to happen, this would, life would continue? I had no idea. It was a, a short role in the beginning of the film, and I had no idea there would ever be sequels, or, or certainly not a huge franchise. The, but the movie was somewhat low budget, right? I mean, how did, you, how did you approach the role? How many takes could you do? And did you have a stunt woman? <laughs> Um, it was um, very low budget. In fact, many of them were John Carpenter's friends, just people helping out. And even the actors and actresses were helping on the set, not just acting. So that was, um, that was pretty exciting. We shot one day and we, we did a lot of practicing because it was a new camera. It was a complicated scene, but we only did two takes. You did in two takes. And John Carpenter, what was he like to work with? I mean, it's a name that's ubiquitous now. Um, John, John was amazing. He was a great director. He was very clear about what he wanted. Him and Deborah Hill uh, did a nice job of kind of demonstrating how they wanted it to look and feel. So, yeah, it was amazing to be able to work with both of them. So you can never feel scared, though. You're too busy worrying about the technical aspects, the camera, the lights, the mark. And stuff, but the fear you had, because I know that it was real, though. Was it real ever? It was very scary sitting upstairs in the dark, um, more or less by myself, knowing that they were coming up the stairs to kill me. <laughs> That's a good way to do it. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, well, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Enjoy. The limbric part of my brain is lit up. We have someone who's basically in my DNA because. One of the first sitcoms I ever saw was The Monsters. I'm sure you've gotten this a lot. Uh, but I always love hearing it again. 
And he once said, I did some research, you might not know Butch Patrick, but you know Eddie Monster. That's for sure. That's I got the best of both worlds. I can walk through an airport without being recognized, but if people ask, what did you ever do? They all know the Munsters. Why do you think that is? Why are you in, I know there's only three channels back then and everything else, but why? Well, because it was a unique show, definitely one, but mainly it had very good production values. It was a family-friendly, wonderful, good, you know, had good family values, very entertaining, and it was from the 60s, which was the premier decade for comedies. You did say, I, I did some research, in the 50s it was almost like um, it was just radio on TV, the dialogue and everything. Sitcoms were more invented in the, in the middle 60s. You were on My Favorite Martian, among other shows, which you didn't even plan to be. What, 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 the mother of my three sons... She was an agent or something, and then she got you on, on you wanted to be a drag strip racer or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Mary Grady was my first and only agent, and her son was Robbie on My Three Sons, and that's probably why I did nine My Three Sons, but she was a great agent, and I was just a kid that had a knack for acting that wanted to be a, drag, a dragster, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had to make you more sinister at first, right? You weren't as much uh, on, as Eddie Munster. Well, they actually, they had the first one was more sinister, Happy Derman, and then they decided he was too much that way, and they wanted to have a regular kid who just happened to be Eddie Munster, and the look was different, but the personality was a normal little boy. Got you. Now, my friends, we have to ask about everyone. For one, Fred Grain, Fred Grain, a friend of mine was on a ski, skiing with him. He happened to be on the same ski slope. He's a very yell, very aristocratic. Was that true? Yeah, Fred was, uh, Fred and Al were a great comedy team. Fred was very, he was a very Harvard, uh, blue blood, you know, very, very, very well educated. Al was very carnival, vaudeville type of guy, but together they did a wonderful comedy team from Car 54 before the Munsters. Fred was a wonderful guy, um, very talented, super talented. They all were talented, but especially Fred. Right. Stage trained and, and everything. How long did that makeup take to put on for Fred, though, in the hot lights? He had a pretty tough time. He was two hours a day plus that heavy uh, foam rubber suit. But luckily, we were only in makeup three days a week. Al was like the king of Greenwich Village. And he had a re he said, Gotti backed restaurant. John Gotti, Al Lewis, yeah. same sentence. He knew everyone. Yeah, he did. He uh, was uh, Mr. New York. He had radio shows. He had comedy clubs. He had his restaurant. He was on Howard Stern constantly. And uh, yeah, he was uh, Al Lewis, Grandpa Munz. He actually was, he ran for an office, uh, governor and senator, as Grandpa Al Lewis. Um, Yvonne Di Carlo, I didn't realize that she was a beauty and she was an iconic actress back in the 30s and 40s. You mentioned Shelley Winters and her had a twist with Earl Flynn, Clark Gable, but she needed this money because her husband, with her stunt producer, had hurt himself? Yeah, he had a horrible accident and the insurance, the st stuntman's insurance didn't cover his medical bills, so literally it depleted their savings and she took the role of Lily Munster as a um, breadwinner. But she was great in it. She had comic timing. Wouldn't you say she was, a, I think she had comic ti timing. She was fabulous. She was our secret weapon. A lot of people thought she could not do, she, they, she had name recognition and she was beautiful, but people thought that she wouldn't be a good comedian. And she turned out to be not only the wonderful matriarch of the family, but a great comedian. And you know, Pat Priest, who took over after eight roles, I think, we still say in our, in our family house, oh, that's Marilyn, oh, that's, that's the unattractive one. I mean, what was she like? And did you have a crush on her? I thought she was hot as a kid. I had a huge crush on Beverly Owen, and yes, Beverly did the first 13 episodes, actually, but it was um, the thing with the unfortunate one, we'll be politically correct, we used to call Marilyn the unfortunate one in the family, <laughs> and, she was, and she was such, she was so drop-dead gorgeous that it was just, it was a very comedy-oriented uh, situation of us, her, her looking at us at face value and not thinking of us as monsters, and vice versa, and, look, and us looking at her as unfortunate. What about the present? With, oh, we should focus on the present, I guess. Um, what do you do now? Do you still sing, rock? Uh, I, not too much in the music. I was like the original Munster Manili. I, uh, I had a records and stuff, but I never was really a uh, true entertainer of that level. But I'm going to be working with Indiana Beach this year. It's a theme park in Indiana, uh, 96 years old. We're doing a retro nostalgia look to it, and I'm going to be handling all their special park activities. And I tour around with a Dragula and a Munster coach and an and a Eddie Munster Harley, so I'm still doing the car thing. Last question, and before I have to hug you. Yeah. Uh, my childhood. Uh, okay, sorry. No problem. Um, paranormal experience. Ever have one? Oh, absolutely. I owned uh, my grandmother's house was haunted, and I recently purchased it, fixed it up, resold it. But yes, um, personally, no. They have not come up and tapped me on the shoulder, or I've never <laughs> seen one. But I have cameras in the house, and I have a lot of visual um, documentation. You've been great. I could talk forever. Thank you for taking the time. You're welcome. Take care.